Sound Barriers, the headline of this year's forum. It is so nice to be able to welcome you all. And uh, we are looking forward to a uh, discussion and um, around innovation, uh, breaking down barriers uh, in, in terms of uh, and, and, and in, in the perspective of COVID-19. So uh, we're very warm welcome. Please um, uh, write in the conversations uh, blog that you are here, where you are from, um, and uh, and we will be ready to begin in a minute. So please let us know who's here. Um, it is uh, so nice to to uh, be able to welcome you all, and uh, I think there will be around 120, 140 present today. Um, we have a, a good morning from Norfolk, UK. Very warm welcome from Norway as well. And Northern Ireland, yes. And uh, Copenhagen, welcome. Great. The, the session that we are about to begin is, uh, is um, around breaking down barriers, with it, which is the headline of this year's international forum and uh, now we have a good morning from texas uh, and from sweden gothenburg one welcome to you all and it is my huge pleasure to uh, welcome uh, the two speakers we have today but this is also a session where we really want you to uh, to uh, add all your questions and queries and observations around breaking down barriers in, in the light of COVID-19. But it is a, a huge pleasure to to welcome uh, Rafael Bangoa, who is the co-director of the uh, Healthcare and Strategy Institute and also an international advisor, a writer uh, and a champion of safety and quality. So. Um, so in a in a short minute, uh, Raphael uh, will begin his speech, and then uh, after that, he will be uh, there will be perspectives from from the deputy CEO of the Danish Society for Patient Safety, Bibi Kerishel. Very warm welcome to you as well. So um, welcome uh, to you from uh, Copenhagen, uh, and uh, I will hand over to you, Raphael. Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Thank you, Inge. Good morning, Vibeke. Um, uh, the idea is, is just to have a short presentation the way um, we've perceived uh, what barriers are in the way and, of course, what how we can uh, uh, facilitate innovation from now on so that we have, uh, a, of course, uh, much more improvement going on. Um, at both the micro and the macro level. Uh, the first point I wanted to come uh, back to is the idea that at the micro level, it looks like there's been a massive amount of innovation. Um, now, <clears throat> that in some countries, especially NHS type of countries, were in the north and in the south of Europe, um, that is uh, fairly important because it means that uh, government and the meso level managers have allowed a certain amount of permissiveness to uh, take place, which does not happen in, let's say, normal times uh, at the provider level, at people who are interacting uh, with patients. Um, that is, of course, very important in the sense that. Um, the, the regulatory requirements at the beginning of uh, the pandemic uh, were suspended, and that allowed a lot of uh, local innovation at the provider level within hospitals and with primary care and social care. So we've seen um, a lot of uh, destigmatization, of course, of the uh, use of technologies uh, but actually, uh, more, uh, which of course everybody has been able to experience as a an innovation that was sort of um, ticking slowly in, uh, but now has had a, of course, a massive 
um, a massive acceleration uh, during um, the pandemic. Now, but more important than that uh, thrust of technology has been the uh, the idea that at the local level, when you let um, nurses, doctors, and all health professionals um, that permissiveness, they can actually uh, pull off uh, many more innovations than what most uh, politicians or managers at the top level would be expecting. So uh, we've seen that takes shape in, of course, many, many ways, um, especially, I think, uh, the most innovative one, uh, even within hospitals and between hospitals in primary care and social care, has been the breaking down of silos. Now, um, those silos seem to be impossible to break um, as we were moving forward towards integrated care in many of our countries between primary care and hospitals and social care. Uh, but now we've seen that it's perfectly possible if you break down those regulatory requirements and you um, let go of the system and you allow local, local uh, innovation to take uh, place by health professionals and local leaders. Uh, so that actually, uh, in terms of innovation, has been even more spectacular than the innovation of use of of all types of technologies to um, bring people together. Um, <clears throat> the important issue, of course, is how to keep that going <clears throat> as we move forward in the next uh, in the next months and years. Um, it seems that uh, in many countries now, you know, in Europe, we're having a a very sort of uh, 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 very dramatic uh, second wave. Now that is that is very important because the uh, the second wave seems to be more persistent, uh, less deadly but more persistent. So uh, the key issue is that in the second wave, I think governments are again allowing that sort of uh, permissiveness at the local level, and we will see again uh, very much innovation taking hold in our systems. Again, breaking down silos, again, using technology in an innovative way, et cetera. So <clears throat> in order to keep that going after uh, we finish uh, the pandemic, after um, all this uh, crisis is over, um, it is necessary to see what is uh, holding back uh, the uh, top level, uh, both political level or macro management level, uh, holding them back in terms of allowing that innovation in the day-to-day, -day, um, uh, either in the pre-crisis mode or after in, um, we uh, go into uh, the post-COVID post uh, crisis. Um, there's been much less innovation at that level than at the micro level. Um, it seems that uh, in at the micro level, um, doctors, nurses, and all health professionals have been able uh, to team up uh, to get their act together. But in some countries at the macro level, um, that uh, teaming up, that uh, capacity to work together, that capacity to break silos between different types of political groups has not happened. Um, I'm not talking about all countries, but I'm thinking, I think I'm talking about very many countries. Um, now, it means that um, the top level is actually becoming a barrier, uh, uh, not only for the moment of managing uh, COVID, uh, and, uh, but it, as, a, as a barrier to innovation. So I think what I'd like to finish up with is just to say that if we wish to scale up all those micro level innovations that we've seen taking hold, uh, we have to make sure that the macro level understands that um, their uh, task is to allow that permissiveness, uh, to continue that permissiveness after the um, pandemic is over, 
and to make sure that they themselves innovate and break silos uh, from now on so that um, different um, learnings uh, that have come out of the pandemic crisis um, also take hold at this uh, macro uh, at the macro level. Um, I would just leave it at that, Inge, and I'm happy to answer questions in relation to um, what I've said. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rafa. It's a pleasure to hear your reflections and uh, the reflections on the micro and um, macro level, um, you could say, and around leaders. And I'm sure that there are a lot of uh, perspectives on that amongst the audience. So please uh, type your comments or questions uh, to Rafa. Um, right now, I will hand over to uh, Bibeke, who will uh, give some perspectives from a Danish view and, and on the presentation of Rafa. Uh, the screen is yours, Bibeke. And thank you very much, Rafa, for um, very thoughtful um, presentations. Uh, just to the audience, we don't have any slides. You will only see uh, us on, from our camera, from the different places where we are. So of those of you who have uh, comments or asking for slides, I can only disappoint you. There's no slides. Um, so. Uh, from, um, I'm from the Danish Society for Patient Safety, and uh, we are an organization, an NGO, that works to improve patient safety in Denmark. That is our uh, aim. And of course, we have uh, been watching what has been uh, going on during the uh, pandemic. And um, I would like to echo some of the things that you have mentioned, Rava, and also to, to, to give my comments uh, on them. Because, I, I, as you said, we have seen a lot of um, silos uh, breaking down very rapidly. Um, and uh, as a perspective from, from outside uh, healthcare or not being part of an organization that delivers healthcare, I think it's interesting to see what are the mechanisms that really can drive breaking down uh, silos. Um, and, and what has been so special during the uh, pandemic, or uh, still is, is that we have a common uh, goal, both uh, if we work in the community care, if we are uh, in a hospital. Uh, so no matter what kind of organization um, you represent, the aim is to um, keep uh, control of, of the uh, pandemic. Um, and if we study what has been going on, I think if we can uh, kind of transfer that on the other side of the pandemic, I think we really are in a situation where we can change the healthcare system, uh, breaking down that kind of uh, barriers as we know the silos are. Um, we can. We have now seen that we can manage that with um, working uh, for a common goal. Um, I, I think uh, what's interesting also, as you um, as you mentioned, um, how fast uh, we have been able to introduce new ways of working. For instance, using uh, technology in terms of communication with patients. Um, I think what at least what we hear in Denmark is that um, there are some reluctance to that in the system still. The reluctance is not among patients, the reluctance is among uh, healthcare providers of uh, different uh, type of professional backgrounds. Um, so I think it's interesting that even though we have this working for a, a common goal, we still see the type of reluctance that we would see in any other situation where we make uh, innovation and improvement. Um, when I uh, reflect on what has been going on uh, in Denmark, uh, and I can later come back to some of the initiatives we have had, I think um, one of the um, most outstanding uh, pieces uh, for me was um, an interview with the um, with a physician who is the lead on the uh, 
Royal College for Anesthesiology and Intensive Care uh, Physicians. Um, he had been very much in the debate during the uh, pandemic and commented on different issues on the number of ventilators and ICU beds and so on. But uh, he came out uh, two weeks ago uh, with an acknowledgement to the social workers and the, um, the people working in uh, community-based care, home care and nursing homes and said, you are actually the real hero of, heroes of the pandemic in Denmark because the work that you did was the reason why we didn't have um, a crisis in the ICUs because you were able to keep COVID-19 out of uh, nursing homes, uh, at least at um, at most uh, nursing homes. And I must say that that has been for me the most um, surprising comment I've heard in this discussion because I don't think I've ever heard an ICU physician coming out and say that those with the less uh, training in our healthcare systems actually had um been doing anything that has been really uh, breaking uh, for the outcome of or um, yeah so so i think if we can break down that kind of barrier that is a, between uh, professional groups that can also really uh, be the the driver of uh, of innovation and in, in proven taking uh, some of these things um, forward Yes, I, I think I will uh, pause uh, for now um, and I can come back with some of the examples of, uh, of what we have been doing. And I don't know if there's any reflections from you, Rafa, otherwise I'll leave it to, to Inge to, uh, to guide us further on. I see there's a very busy, um, there's a busy chat running. Thank you. Um, uh, I think that, um, that uh, uh, there are some questions around, for instance, uh, and that I, I think that's to you uh, right now, Raphael, that, that uh, the clinicians out there are not uh, experiencing this breaking down barriers so much. They, they actually experience new rules. Uh, so, so how can we overcome that? Uh, can you uh, can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Uh, how can we overcome that the that the, the the individual clinician also feels that these barriers are, are broken down? And it's Sabrina who has uh, posed that question. Well, I suppose that me that depends on which country uh, we're talking about. I think I was trying to generalize in relation to what I have seen. Um, that this um, COVID, um, in many ways, uh, uh, of course, the crisis has been expressed within hospitals and between hospitals and primary care and social care, as Vibeke was saying. Um, now, uh, within hospitals, um, there has been innovation because clinical leaders were allowed to lead. Um, versus not being allowed to lead before, uh, but not leading on on their medical issues. Of course, they have to lead on 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 what they decide in clinical terms. But they were allowed to lead in organizational and management terms. They were allowed to take decisions about how to move other doctors from one place to another and five nurses from here to there how to um, integrate the work between primary care and hospitals, uh, <clears throat> how to send people over to long-term care, um, social care. Um, now that was, that was local decision-making. So the point I was making that may not be relevant to all countries is that since we've allowed that and we've seen that health professional local leadership, why not keep it forever? why not make sure that that teamwork that we've seen uh, that that health professional leadership has been expressed in such a strong way in the toughest crisis we've had in the last hundred years for some reason we had to act really fast 
and therefore there was um, a letting go situation, both in regulatory terms and in managerial terms, and that has allowed that to happen. Now, that of course has not happened everywhere and where it has happened has not scaled up. So what we need to do is to see what were the elements that made that possible. And if that is so, since there was so much innovation in organizational and managerial terms, why not explore why that happened and let, and make it continue forever? Okay, thank you very much. Um, and if that, uh, please please uh, let your um, your questions uh, come come in. Um, uh, I might have some trouble seeing those, but. Um, but Inge, this, can I comment? Uh, yes, please. Uh, on this, because I, I think I think it's it's really interesting um, if uh, what has actually been been possible to do, and and I would like to echo um, my experience is the same as as you, Raphael. And I think we have uh, set up some um, networks for people working with um, patient safety across the country because we know that the, the model that we usually have for uh, the learning system we usually have is uh, have some delays that were um, not very uh, good uh, for the situation at the moment. So we changed that. And some of the learnings we've had from um, that network is that the, the system we have, for instance, for, uh, for designing new guidelines, um, wasn't able to work because that is put up very bureaucratically. So you would have one committee that would need to um, agree on a guideline before you send it out. And uh, that system was totally taken out of um, out of uh, place. And uh, the uh, guidelines came directly from the National Board of Health. Sometimes they even posted them um, on a press uh, conference before the uh, hospitals and uh, local communities had received them. So when uh, healthcare professionals met with patients, patients had heard about the new guidelines before uh, at the front line. And, um, and I think that really changed the system because at that level, you needed to uh, find new ways to get information in, but also to um, make sure that how do, what does this guideline mean in our uh, ward or our local uh, place? And um, uh, what we also saw was, I, I think, very interesting because in in one of the net or the, both the networks we have set up, we have seen that people um, have become much more eager to learn from one another because everybody experienced that they they had so much new information. So uh, what we usually hear in uh, healthcare is, so this was not invented here. So it might be that it works in your hospital, but you have other conditions than I have. So it would be not be able to work here. So I would have to design it myself. We didn't have the time for that kind of conversations now. So if somebody had worked out a new way of, of doing things, how do you make sure that you have the right uh, PPE? Where do you place them and things like that? they would right away take that, um, you could say, workflow and um, implement it right away in another organization. So, so I think, first of all, it's it's a barrier that has uh, been uh, taken down, but it's also like that the power for decision making have moved much closer to where care is delivered than in uh, conference rooms and uh, nice offices and, um, and so on. But of course, also, I, I did see the one of the comments here, there's also been a lot of restrictions for uh, for staff because the way that you have to deliver care has, there's been some limitations on um, what the individual can, um, can decide on uh, because at least for some places, uh, the restrictions on uh, where can I, how can I meet, uh, how can I leave and so on has been changed uh, very much.
Thank you, Vivica. Um, there is a question from, from uh, David McNally. Um, and uh, he, he, he uh, asks, do we need micro level, macro level leaders to stop leading and managing, but create the right conditions and amplify mi micro innovations? I think that that goes a bit back to what you were um, touching upon, Rafa. So would you please uh, elaborate a little on that? Yeah, I think we both, uh, Vibika and I, were both saying uh, the same thing in the sense, and the the example of techno of, uh, of guidelines is a very uh, good one, um, of over-involvement uh, from the top level, um, which the, the top level in most of our countries, even in Central European countries, where, it's, where, where it's basically it's not governmental, but it's health insurances, but even more in uh, governmental-led um, health system, um, tends to micromanage everything. Now, that tendency to micromanage, um, um, for some, for the, I think they realized that they could not continue doing that at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so they let go. So I think what we're saying here is, please let go forever. <laughs> uh, um, in the sense that your job, as the question I think was very rightly posed, is um, the word, uh, the, the, what the top level has to do is create conditions. Mm -hmm. So it's not to stop leading, it's to lead in a different way. And to lead in a different way from the micro level means allow the local level to identify solutions because they will always be better than the ones you identify at the central level. Mm -hmm in whatever system you're in, because you're too far away from action, from the patient, et cetera. So you're not gonna know how to pull off innovation. Um, the second thing that I think is worth saying is that the, the, if, if the micro level has been able to break silos really quickly, um, why were they there in the first place? I think some are built by clinicians at the micro level. They, everybody wants their little vertical uh, kingdom. But at the same time, um, some of them are created from above because of the way we finance or we commission. So it tends to be uh, created, the silos seems to be created above. For example, in many of our countries, we are not <coughs> commissioning or financing or paying um, if we have a contract arrangement between the payer and the provider, <clears throat> we are not doing it um, with a system which is collaborative and which integrates care. We keep on uh, financing primary care, we finance hospital care, and then we finance social care by somebody else. So to be expecting um, non-siloed work across providers when you're actually commissioning that way from the top, you're obviously creating barriers. So I think if we want to integrate work across different components of healthcare, as I think we all know and we're all trying to do, we're gonna need to make sure that the top level leads in a different way from now on. Hugh McCaughey, which, who uh, is head of patient safety and quality, and the other day when we were talking about technology, uh, I think quite rightly said that <clears throat> for that type of transformation across components in healthcare, across the silos we have, um, if we want to use technology, um, IT technology in, a, in the most effective way, it has to, every time you introduce a new technology, it has to be for transformation, not to root the existing system. Because if you use technology and you put a whole bunch of IT stuff into our systems today. If they are separate silos, you'll just have separate silos going faster. You won't have integrated silos, um, uh, non-silos. So the important thing is for us to make sure that whatever we do from now on, let's let the local level lead in many ways and the top level um, uh, create conditions so that the local level can lead. I well, I I think um, 
That that sounds very good. Uh, but are there barriers that we can't uh, remove? There was a question around that. Uh, are there barriers that those just won't go away? Yeah, but that's really hard. So that's for Vibika. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, as you as you spoke, Rafa, I was I was reflecting on on some of the things that uh, that we have heard in Denmark, and and um, we often hear the the issue of uh, collaboration between the different parts of healthcare because even though it's uh, tax uh, funded, there is it still comes from different uh, boxes the money. So um, when you uh, for instance, move some kind of treatment from one place to another with the money uh, follow the patient is always waste the, the question. And um, there's been a lot of time spent on uh, finding ways to agree on uh, how do we work together from the different sectors and how what should be the information before you transfer a patient from one place to the other and, and so on. And I think a lot of that work had um, beforehand at least in, in involved uh, some kind of level of people uh, actually doing the work. Perhaps not the very front line, but at least some middle managers. And um, it seems we have a, a, a strong belief in guidelines and agreements and contracts and so on in healthcare. And, um, we believe that if we have agreed something and we put it on paper and this is how I would communicate with you uh, about this patient and then you would take the patient and so on. And uh, what we have seen is that everybody have been bypassing that uh, at this moment. So instead of following the guidelines they would that they then themselves have designed, they would do something differently, which has been much more smooth. Um, so um, I, I think actually it's it, it some of that is a matter of the people in the system and not the system itself. So uh, I think I I would go and challenge uh, middle managers saying, do you need all those guidelines that you have actually spent so much time on on um, on designing? Uh, because what you have seen working now is actually the opposite of that. Um, yeah. I think that's my that's my reflection uh, on on that. That's great, Inge. I can come in, uh, um, please. I think uh, I was happy to hear that in Denmark, uh, social care and um, and healthcare uh, had pulled off a better job than elsewhere. Uh, here in Spain, that didn't work at all. Uh, uh, Eighty percent of our deaths. Um, have been in long-term care, uh, social care, oh. uh, but but also um, it, it it has shown the pandemic has shown the very profound interdependency there is between health and social care. So unless we start seeing them as a unity, mm. unless we start mm. seeing them as a single activity, like they're doing in New Zealand in a place called Cambridge in parts of New Zealand where they call that um, one system, one budget. Um, if Unless we start seeing those two in the same way, we haven't really learned from this pandemic in those countries where we've had a very dramatic um, death rate in long-term care, social care. So <clears throat> the important thing is, uh, is, as we said before, to allow the local level learn and we've seen that they can learn fast and improve, but to start opening, what does improvement mean at the policy level? Uh, because improvement, there's there seems to be less learning at the policy level. And the unity between health and social care depends on the policy level, macro level, getting their act together. If, if they can get their act together, they will be able to um have a sort of one system going and if we have a new pandemic which we will in three four five six years um we won't be hit in the same way but if the policy level does not integrate care between health and social care we will be in many countries repeating 
the sad story of this pandemic. Yes, and um, well, that's uh, is that because this is actually an avalanche? Um, so it's like a landslide, and then it stops, and and we, uh, well, we just sort of um, push some things. We we don't relearn. We don't. Uh, we're not able to to actually um, pull uh, certain things out of our. Uh, system and out of ourselves as, as uh, managers and, and leaders. But is there is there a process for learning at the top level? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there is one at the local level because you're all working yeah. on quality, patient safety, um, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I was I, in, in April when the whole thing began, I played around with James Reason's Swiss cheese and I said, I think uh, the world pandemic uh, has gone through all the holes of the Swiss cheese uh, because all the barriers have been broken and we've ended up with a very dramatic situation. Now, uh, I think at the top level, the processes are what Vibeke was saying. Everybody has their own little um, budget to play with. And therefore, uh, there's no shared vision on health and social care or primary care in hospitals. And if there isn't a shared vision, um, uh, you are not using the budget in the right way in order to bring integrated care. So I think that for me, the key thing was would be to explore how the macro level could have a process for learning. So not just have it at the micro level where it's happening, thanks to the work BMJ, IHI throughout the years, et cetera, as Pedro Delgado was saying this morning, I think the important thing is you have to you have to uh, understand at the macro level. Politicians have to understand that they do not have the right learning processes in place. Yeah, and there's a comment from Sasha saying several really important points here. Ralph Stacey's complexity and cre creativity in organizations provide some useful insights to this discussion. So. Mm -hmm. That's uh, something to, to read further on. Thank you, uh, Raphael. I would uh, like uh, to, um, to, to, uh, to take up a question then that Anne Duffy has, um, has posed because I think that some of the things that, that we are uh, circulating around is also how, how do we uh, create a learning system and um, what what part does a uh, having a communication strategy and involving uh, patients and um, uh, citizens in in the the work? Uh, what what has that? Uh, can you say something about about that? Uh, is is uh, integrating um, patients and and uh, well the citizens uh, stakeholders is that part of of, uh, of well sort breaking down barriers here and, and how can we go about that? So I think Vibeke, uh, you might start. Yes, uh, thank you, Inge. I, I think, um, Anne, uh, you're posting a really, really interesting um, uh, question or comment here. Uh, because I, I think what we have seen um, during the uh, pandemic is that uh, what is happening in, in any kind of organization, they are switching back to command and control. So um, as some of you might remember, uh, Derek Feely and Jason Leach had this model uh, some years ago on, on moving from um, command and control to, to uh, co-production. I think we are, uh, at the moment, we are back at least in the, uh, the C-suite, we are back at the command and control, and the innovations at the front line has been um, has been changed too, but I haven't seen very much um, invitations uh, to patients uh, to participate in how can we change the system at the at the moment. And I, what I hear in the Danish system is a lot of frustration uh, because actually this has been very much. Um, of interest, of course, of uh, patients. So, for instance, how do we uh, manage uh, contact with patients? 
how can we have visits from relatives in hospital and nursing homes and so on. Uh, that has been only a, dis uh, a decision made by uh, people in governance and uh, patients and relatives had not at all been uh, invited into this. And um, my reflection on this is that um, it might be that uh, how we co-create with patients had never been part of the contingency plans. So we have actually never taken into consideration how will we work with patients in a situation uh, like this. Um, so I, I, we have a session later on today also discussing uh, some of these matters. Um, but, but I think this is really a time for re reflection on, um, on that. And I, at least I see in Denmark um, a, a, a strong voice from, from patients' organizations saying uh, we need to make sure that uh, people with dementia still have a, a visit from their uh, relatives because we cannot close down uh, nursing homes for, for forever for visits because these people that are in yeah, the, the very end of their life, they need to be together with their families as well. So, uh, so I think Anne has um, has a, a, a really important um, comment, and I haven't seen anybody talking very much about what are the perspectives of uh, patients, and and that might also be why um, the innovation at the um, at least at some part at the bedside has been so great because clinicians had to deal with what they really like to do, taking care of. Uh, the sickest of the sickest. So yeah, that might be part of that. I don't know what, how it is in Spain, Raphael, but um, at least I think what I've heard from other countries, um, patient involvement had not been part of it either. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. I think uh, I think we all know, we've all heard polit uh, you know, all politicians saying the system has to be centered on patients. Mm. Uh, but I think we all know that we're really far away from that. Um, there's been a lot of tokenism in the sense that we're involving patients, but only few countries really have um, the process to hear the voice of patients and for it to be reaching uh, the policy level. I think, as you're saying, it's going to be easier to bring in the voice at the micro level, and, and we've heard the voice at the micro level. Um, what uh, I, I, I think I can talk about two or three countries where uh, we're being asked um, how can we get our voice into uh, the next phase, the post-COVID phase, uh, because in the pre-COVID phase, we're not happy with what is happening. We've been knocking on doors for 10, 15 years on co-production, and we're not getting anywhere. So uh, what can we do? And I said, I'm saying to them, write your own report. Mm -hmm. As patients, you know, do your own report. Don't don't call doctors, nurses, uh, public health people, uh, uh, managers. Just write your own report of what happened, and use it um, uh, so that you you express what your expectations are for the next phase. Because um, I think in most countries. All patients are saying, okay, uh, COVID has been a, a drama, but non-COVID is becoming a bigger drama uh, mm. because we're, uh, uh, we're getting delayed on cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, whatever. So since we're getting delayed and now we have a second curve, we're getting re-delayed, re re if that word exists, I'm not sure. <laughs> but if we're getting re-delayed, what does that mean? Because once you get delayed and re-delayed, you may be delayed forever because it's going to be really hard for the system to pick you back. Mm -hmm. We know, for example, uh, people are being picked up um, uh, uh, very late. All screening cancer, cancer screenings have been stopped. What is going to happen in the second curve? The same thing? Or that? So I think patients are the ones who have the biggest argument to say um, we need real co-production from now on, and this is what it means. But they should write their own report and make a big deal of that report. 
So you really uh, invite patients to to be more active in this and uh, and and really give their thought to this as well. Yes, and take and, it to Parliament. And yeah. take it to Parliament. Yeah. So this is this is an invitation for all you patient organisations out there to um, to pick up that. Um, I would like to touch upon a question that has been in in the chat. Uh, around uh, joy in work you could say um it's uh martin patel who uh who uh, asked a question around how do we um we have had this this uh first wave and and there was a lot of you could say um from the positive side innovation energy uh in in that but how do we maintain uh joy in work how do we? I I hear about fatigue uh, out there. So so how do we um, maintain that that people are actually uh, continuing to to go to work and and uh, be uh, um, joyful and also uh, make these innovations uh, continually? Vibeke. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's, that's me... a one million dollar question. No, I just, think it's a it's a Basque Spanish trick, so I have time to think. Yeah, that's mm. fine. I I think I think um, first of all, I think it's it's a really good uh, question, and I I think perhaps that is the question that most leaders should be uh, worried about, and that what should uh, you know be keeping them up at night. That should not be the number of patients, but but the number of staff uh, they still have in their pocket of uh, of people. Um, I I'm not sure that 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 some of the um, you know some of the things uh, I've been seeing from NHS that uh, people are standing on their balconies and probably also from Italy and Spain and and clapping of um, of the healthcare professionals and and so on and of course that kind of acknowledgement can give you some energy but but we cannot live on that forever leaders need to be uh, to consider what what matters to their staff what is important to their staff and um, i think perhaps that is a very very uh, local and individual uh, thing because as we see the pandemic now, it, it seems to be very different uh, within the countries, how it, um, how it rolls out. And we also know that, um, that, uh, the, uh, the, the, that the life situation of our staff might be very different in, um, in different countries. But uh, when we ask our um, uh, local risk managers in in hospitals and communities in Denmark. So, what has been, what do you think has been working very well during uh, the pandemic, and that has been the attendance of leadership of local leadership. So, so I think if we can still keep senior leaders out of their offices and among their staff, so they would be very frequently on their uh, touring in awards and so on. So the acknowledgement of, I know that, that this is a tough situation, but also perhaps of leaders going and do some interviews with their uh, frontline staff to understand what would really help you in this situation. Because as it is with, um, with patient, it is the same with staff. It might not be that there's very much that would make your life much easier. And um, I think uh, all the, the whole discussion around PPEs uh, is, a, is an example of, there was a shortness in the beginning, so we couldn't get the things that we needed. That was uh, global. But I think now the situation is, is very different. But let's go and ask the staff, what kind of PPEs would you prefer on this unit? What we hear from um, from some of the units in Denmark, in, in Denmark, I think 70% of of um, of the uh, of the total staff, no matter of professional background, in in healthcare are women. But all the um, 
the, the, the things that are made to cover up yourself, whether it's a full body uh, suit or it's a gown, they are actually made for male. So a lot of women experience that they every day have to wear some clothes that don't actually fit them. And that might be one of the things that as if you as a leader could make sure that the PPEs you ask people to wear, they actually fit them. So, so I think, you know, for, for, for senior leaders to get out there and, and learn what matters to their uh, staff could be uh, one of the um, answers to how we, how we survive for the next wave or at least for the winter or something like that. Yeah. So Have you had your, your Spanish moment to think? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vivica. No, and you give, you've, I, I mean, I, I would agree with the human resource component that you just brought in. I think that's key. Um, I think the word that stands out, of course, is collaboration um, in, in this whole thing. I think the word teamwork that we've all been talking about for 30 years has actually happened. Mm. So how do we sustain collaboration and teamwork? Um, I think that's linked with um, scaling up. Um, I think scaling up is the obligation of the macro, meso and macro level. So meso leaders, macro leaders have to understand uh, what happened here. Where did innovation happen? Understand it, interiorize it and say, if that has, if that's where it happened, how can I scale that up? Just how can I scale that up? And that will bring in sustainability. And then there's a small detail, uh, which I'd like to bring in is money. I think, I think money will help to sustain things, but only if the vision that we've just ex expressed of, of why did it happen? Where did it happen? What shape it took? And how can I scale that up? And then I put money for transformation in that direction. Then I can sustain it in time. Um, the second uh, thing to, to, uh, to sort of oblige sustainability is to know that in the last, um, let's say two things, in the last 30 years, we've had 10 leaps from uh, viruses from um, animals to humans. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason to think that that's not gonna continue. Now, in order, so we need to sustain in order to be ready for next time. But we also need to sustain in order to be ready for the day-to-day non-COVID, et cetera. Because that is the behavior, the collaborative behavior is the one we need for COVID and non-COVID. And therefore, um, I think the top leaders, whether they meet in Brussels, whether they meet at the national level in their countries, what they have to do is to understand what happened and not go back to what Vibeke was calling top down because mm -hmm. it is it is bad for their countries it's bad for themselves to go back to top down thank you um you mentioned money um Rafa uh there's a question around data uh mm -hmm. from Sabina does do we need data? Uh, are there data out there? Um, and and uh, what what would the role of, of data be in, in sustaining this? Well, I think we were ready with data at the in most of our countries with um, the electronic care records, medical records at the hospital level, and in some countries between hospitals and primary care. So that's been very useful uh, to have that infrastructure in place. And I think countries that didn't have it better uh, <clears throat> move into that very quickly. Um, but where there has been a failure is in public health data uh, and epidemiological data between regions and the national level in big countries. Um, there's been uh, too much uh, disunion um, between the information that was coming from the local level and was integrated at the national level and that became, became, in my country, and I think in other countries, very politicized, um, as if people were actually hiding information. Or something. But So I think we need a very good public health data infrastructure from now on, and that is a big learning exercise. And again, that is more of a macro-level activity to get um, going 
um, and it should get going quite quickly. Thank you, Rafa. And uh, I certainly hope that someone will pick that up. Vivica? Yeah, uh, I, I, think, uh, I think it's been uh, very interesting to see how we can have real-time data. We've had real-time data in, in Denmark, um, I think, uh, since April or something like that. We, have the daily, we get the daily numbers of uh, numbers of tests, numbers of positive tests, numbers of patients admitted, numbers of death, numbers of patients in ICU, even numbers of patients on ventilators in ICU. And they are, are, are public and they are real time. And I, I think for somebody who's been in, in working in improvement for the last uh, 25 years, uh, I have been struggling to get just some kind of real time data uh, for uh, units because we know how much that is a driver when we work in improvement. So, so I think this is uh, a really a gift to people in uh, working with improvement, but I think also we need to challenge those who handle data to say, now we have seen it's possible to get the real time data. We need to have that on everything else than on COVID. Because um, as, you, as you mentioned, um, Rafa, COVID is not the only thing. At, at some point, we also uh, need to um, get back on track on improvement in, in other things and also make sure that patients with other um, diseases and so on get their appointments on time and surgery on time and, and so on. And we know that data is a really driver from for that, and uh, as the system is uh, able to deliver on, on COVID, I, I think for me a challenge would be, so what kind of other data are you actually able to deliver as you have been with the, with the COVID? Because I, I you know, every, every evening in the news when they mention the numbers, my thought is always, uh, what if this was the number of patients who got a um, cancer diagnosis uh, today? Could we have drive with the same um, uh, kind of data and, and what impact could that have on, uh, on healthcare? So, so I think this is one of the really huge uh, takeaway uh, from this pandemic. We need to uh, be able to transfer this to other areas of healthcare. Thank you very much, uh, Vibeke. And I think that is summing up uh, quite well some of the discussions we have had. I have, uh, well, the, the moving to co-production, um, the, the real-time data, uh, the learning systems that we have to build, uh, as you talked about, Rafa. We are in the last minute of, of this uh, first live session at the International Forum. Uh, Rafa, uh, do you have any final comments? I would like to thank uh, the audience very much. But Rafa, uh, you are up for the, the final um, um, perspectives here. Yeah, well, <clears throat> thank you, Inge. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I mean, it's been a pleasure. And having lived uh, in Copenhagen for seven years, I, I, I always remember that it, it, when I'm asked which is your favorite uh, city? I always say Copenhagen, and not, it's not because you're there. That's what I. That's what I truly believe. Um, now, in relation to, I think the most important thing um, is to avoid now this what this creeping in of what people are calling um, COVID fatigue because it, it is taking us towards some dangerous place uh, with complacency. And that complacency is appearing, of course, at the, at the individual level, um, but it shouldn't appear uh, either at the individual or at the governmental level. Um, all countries are trying to pull off um, the famous balance between economy and health. But actually, if we look towards Orient, and Orient does not mean only China, it actually means Australia, New Zealand, um, South Korea, et cetera. Um, they've done a much better job than we have in Europe. So we have to be humble, learn from them about how to manage these types of crises. Um, there, there are zero cases today in Australia. 
and because they've had a really tough go and they've put health before economy, but now their economy will grow. Now, I know that's a tough one to bite for politicians, but actually the big learning in from Orient is that one. And I'm talking about democratic countries in Orient and they actually um, have pulled off a much better job than us in Europe. And definitely we should not be looking at what is happening in North America and Brazil, because that's the worst of all um, of all cases. So let's all hope we have a new president in US tomorrow. Oh, so we, well, we are we are finishing off at a uh, at the really high pod politics level now. But uh, thank you, Rafa. Thank you, Bibike, and thank you most of all to all the audience. And I wish you a very pleasant um, international forum. And uh, thank you very much for all your comments and questions. We will be gathering them. Please connect uh, on the website. Find uh, Rafa, Bibeke, me, uh, continue the conversations. Have a fantastic day. Thank you very much all.